Of all the fears that grip our hearts, no fear is greater than the fear of death. There are those who will tell you that death is a natural part of life. But if death is just a part of life, then why does it cause us such anger and sorrow? When God created humanity, he intended for us to grow more and more beautiful over time. But in one tragic moment, we unleashed sin into the world, and everything broke, including our bodies. Death is the ultimate consequence of sin, and it fills God's heart with anger and sorrow even more than it does ours, because death was not a part of God's original plan. The Bible says that when Jesus approached the tomb of his friend Lazarus, he quaked with rage, and his eyes filled with tears. He was overwhelmed by the suffering caused by death, a curse we had brought upon ourselves. Death's curse was physical. Both the world and our bodies were decaying. But death's curse was also spiritual, eternally separating humanity from their creator, the source of all light, love, and life. But because of God's amazing love, he chose to surrender all power and glory to rescue us from death. Jesus, God's only son, was expelled from the presence of the Father and thrust into complete darkness in our place. He took humanity's curse upon himself, breaking death's grip on us and purchasing humanity a place at the Father's side forever. A day is coming when the true King will return at last to restore the world to its full glory, and us with it, renewing both soul and body. You'll still be yourself, but even more so. You'll finally be the real you. On that day, we'll look at each other and say, I always knew you could be like this. I saw glimpses of the real you, flashes of it, and now here you are. Our future is not an ethereal, impersonal one. You're not going to float through the clouds. You're going to walk. You're going to eat. You're going to laugh. You're going to hug. You're going to sing in realms and degrees of power and joy that you cannot now imagine. Some will tell you not to fear death because it's part of life. But Jesus says not to fear death because it's been defeated. And the day will come when Jesus embraces you with his nail-scarred hands and says, welcome home. I have so much to show you. Good morning, and welcome to LUMC's weekly online worship service. We are so happy to have you join us as we continue our series, God on Film. Today, we are going to be looking at the new movie, Ghostbusters Afterlife, and discussing heaven. But before we do, let's begin with some music. Please join me and let's sing together. Streets of gold beyond the grave. 
Before we get into our message, I want to share with you how you can get the most out of the service today. If you're joining us on the website, you'll see a link off to the right. If you're joining us on a Facebook, you'll see the link down below. This link is for the connection card. The connection card is a great way for you to record your attendance, take the next steps in your faith, and to share your prayer requests. We are a church that wants to pray for you. And I can tell you, whatever you put in that prayer request box, our pastor will personally pray for you and send you an email letting you know he's done so. And as long as you do not check that box that says, do not add me to the church prayer list, we'll make sure other members of the church are praying for you as well. For the next two announcements, I'd like to turn it over to some of our church leaders. They're gonna share with you current offerings for our children, as well as our church's practice of breakthrough prayer. Good morning, I'm Debbie Andrews, the Director of Children's Ministry here at Lynn Haven. Last month, we had 77 children who participated in our Focus VBS. This was a virtual backyard program, and I want to thank each person who helped make this possible. We had a lot of fun. This month, we are offering some other programs for your children and grandchildren. Beginning the week of August 17th, we'll have a mini three-day VBS program called Bolt that we'll be offering to our children. Also, this month we're offering a, a very interactive unit in Kids Zone called Warriors of Faith. We'll be looking at people like Joshua, David, Moses, Esther from the Old Testament. In order to find out more information about these programs and to stay connected with everything that we're doing in children's ministry, the best thing to do is to join our email list. You can do this by emailing me at debbie at lenhaven.church or by indicating this somewhere on your connection card. Thanks and have a great day. Hi, Lynn Haven family. I know we all have a lot on our hearts and minds these days with COVID, with the idea of wrestling with returning to school and work and in-person worship safely, things like racial injustice and just general tension and divisiveness in our country these days. Hurricane season is coming up and all the things that the year 2020 has seemed to brought us. But I wanted to share a reminder on some good news with you today. Um, and it comes to us from Ephesians chapter three, verse 20, which tells us, now all glory to God, who is able within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. So the great news is that we can give these things up to God and ask him to break through these situations. In case you missed it or need a refresher, there was a sermon series done in March around the concept of breakthrough prayer. And all these past sermons are available on the church website, lynnhaven.church under the sermon section. This sermon series covered things like threshold prayer, laying things at the threshold of God and saying, Lord, your will be done, and archer prayer, where you pray for God's will in a very specific area. We as a congregation want to continue to engage in breakthrough prayer together, and we have a few ways to help us do that during this time. One, you can indicate your breakthrough prayers on the connection card and they'll be made published on the weekly email so that we can all be praying together with and for each other. The second is we're making breakthrough prayer bracelets available to help be a daily constant reminder that we should be praying for God to break through these situations and maybe even spark some conversation with people that we might see um, about what these bracelets are. And then of course, the third way is to continue praying our 757 prayer at 757 in the morning and at night. 
Um, we just want to remind you, we love you and we're praying with you and for you during these times. And we're praying that God just breaks through. Now, let's continue our worship of God this morning with another song and joining together to affirm our faith through one of our creeds. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place when we go. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, He is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. This week, we are continuing our series, God on Film, with the movie Ghostbusters Afterlife and a discussion about heaven. Pastor Brandon is going to share with us some insights as to why we want to go to heaven, as well as some truths about heaven we might not even realize. So grab your Bible and your message notes, and let's continue our series, God on Film. So when I met my wife, right, when we first started dating, we loved to play games, right? We loved to play games with my parents, with her parents, with our friends, uh, and, and we played every kind of game. We played board games. We played things like apples to apples. We just loved games. And early on, one of the unfortunate things that happened was I seemed to win a lot. It seemed like every game we played, no matter what we played, somehow I won. And the reason I say that was unfortunate is because very quickly, my parents, my sister, and Leanne all decided that they didn't care who won as long as I didn't win, right? And so it was like I was a baby turtle being attacked by seagulls. I mean, they were coming after me every time we played. And it was one of those things, it was just so stressful to play. But I'll be honest with you, what stressed me out even more than the fact that they were all coming after me was any time we'd play a game with one of these. Are you familiar with one of these? The Sands of Time. And this little thing right here, 
would cause me such stress. I mean, even just looking at it now, I start to feel the stress, I start to feel the pressure because this little thing, right, as you watch it, you just feel like time's running out. You feel the, the pressure. You feel like, like you need to do something, but you don't have enough time in which to do it. And every second you look at it, you realize that your time is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And the pressure just builds and builds and builds. And you know, what I realize is that many people feel like this. They feel this stress when it comes to their lives. Right? Like maybe, maybe for some of you, you're, you're older. Right? You look at your life and you realize you got less years ahead of you than you have behind you, and you're starting to think about the sands of time. You're starting to think about the fact that your sands are running out, and you're feeling that pressure. You're trying to make the most out of these years. Or you're, you're just thinking about, like, what's going to happen next? And for others of you, maybe you're not older. Right? Maybe you're young, but you've lost somebody young recently, or you've lost somebody in your life, and it's made you realize your mortality. Or maybe in the midst of this pandemic, you realize how quickly things can change. And so you start thinking about the sands of time and how to live those sands to the fullest and what happens after the sands run out. See, this is one of those things that happens to us, that at some point in our lives, we start thinking about heaven. We start, we start thinking about what happens after the sands of time run out. And, you know, one of the interesting things that we, we find is that we all have different reasons for wanting to go to heaven, right? We all have reasons that we're like, I, I just need to be in that place after I die, right? This is where I want to be when my sands of time run out. Like, if you're following along in your notes, here's your first fill-in. One of the reasons that we often believe that we want to go to heaven is because we believe that heaven, heaven is a place that will help us to cope with the pain of life. Or maybe another way of putting it is heaven is a place that will help us to escape the pain. Right? When we look at our lives right now, we think about all the things that bring us pain. Maybe that is some sort of health issue that you're dealing with. Maybe that's some emotional stuff that you're going through or the stress that you're feeling in life. Maybe it's relationships that have fallen apart. But you look to heaven and you think, there's this place that when my life here is done, I can go where I will be free of all of that and I can't wait to get there. Others of you, your reason might be number two, which is that for you, heaven is a chance to reunite with the people you love. Heaven is a chance for you to reunite with your loved ones. Like I think about my grandparents who passed away just a few years ago. I can't wait to reconnect with them in heaven, right? Or some of my grandparents, my grandfather who died when I was younger, right? I can't wait to see him again. I think about the fact that, that my mom had a miscarriage when I was a kid, or we had a miscarriage a few years ago. I mean, I can't wait to connect with those souls in heaven. There's this part of heaven that we can't wait for because we get to connect with the people we love. So we definitely want to go to heaven. Another reason that we want to go to heaven is because we figure, hey, it's better than the alternative, right? I've yet to meet a whole lot of people who are like, yeah, that heaven doesn't sound that great. I'm going to take my chances on the other place, right? That, that's not what we think. And, and whether you think that that is fire and brimstone and these, these terrible images of hell or just the absence of God and whatever that must feel like, that's not a place most people want to go. And so they want to go to heaven instead. And then, of course, there's always the spiritual reason, right? The, the pure reason, and that is that many of us want to go to heaven because we believe that heaven is a place where we get to spend eternity in God's presence. Right? And for many of you, that's why you want to go, right? You love Jesus, you love the Lord, and you can't imagine anything better than spending eternity in God's presence. You've had moments where you felt God's Holy Spirit here on earth, and you can't wait to be in a place where you actually have no separation between you and God. I mean, these, these are amazing reasons to want to go to heaven. And you know what's interesting is that not only do we have reasons why we want to go to heaven— we also come up with reasons why we should go to heaven, right? We convince ourselves that this is a place that we deserve to be, right? For instance, one of the reasons that we think we deserve to go to heaven is because we think we've been a good person, right? We think, you know, we, we may not know exactly what the qualifications are for heaven, but we think being a good person is a pretty good reason to be able to get into heaven, and so we should be able to go, 
right? And the interesting thing is I've yet to meet a person who didn't think they were the good person, right? We, we can all name people who we think are bad people, but pretty much for the most part, we all think we're the good person who should get to go to heaven. We never really figure out if there's a spectrum, right? like how good you have to be or any of that stuff. We just figure you should be basically good, and we think we meet that standard. Or, or for some people, right, the reason that they think they should go to heaven is because they think they've sinned less than others, right? And so if, if hell is a place for people who've done awful things, we say to ourselves, well, I'm not them, right? I'm not perfect. I haven't earned that qualification, but I'm at least not them, so I should still get to go, right? If they're the bar for who doesn't get in, then I should definitely get to get in. Another reason that we come up with is we believe that if God loves us, then God will let us into heaven, right? If God loves us, then God will let us into heaven. Essentially, we say to ourselves, if God truly loves us, why wouldn't God let us come to a place that amazing? If God loves us, why would God ever want us to go to the other place? We kind of put that onus on God, right? If God, if we don't get to go to heaven, it's because it's you didn't love us. And then, of course, there are people who have what, again, is a more spiritual, more pure reason, and that is because they think they should be able to go to heaven because they have found salvation in Jesus. That Jesus is their Lord and their Savior. They know they can't save themselves. They know they'll never be good enough. But they've put their trust in Jesus, that he is the one who can give them eternal life. And so when you think about it, right, when we, when we notice that the sands of time are going to run out, we think about heaven, we think about why we want to go, we think about why we think we should go. But then we also have to wrestle with the question, well, what does it even look like? Right? We're all longing to go to this place, but what in the world is it even going to be like? And we all have images in our head, right? We all have things that we've imagined, things that we've created, right? Sometimes we just picture it's a big fun place to hang out with people we love. Sometimes it's, it's big streets of gold with mansions. We've got all these images in our head. But I figured if we really want a good picture of what heaven's going to be like, we should ask kids. And so that's what we did, right? We interviewed some of the kids of our church, and we asked them, what do you think heaven looks like? And here's what they said. I think heaven is a cloud with a lot of light, and all the best people live up there. Heaven is a beautiful place in the world because they, there's probably um, friends out there and um, animals. I think heaven is a place with clouds, God, and glitter. I think it's made out of rock. I think it made out. I think it made out a bit and rock and and hung really strong weight, really strong weight. Everyone gets together and be silly and have fun. I think heaven is a place where everybody's happy and everybody gets along. I think heaven is a place where the weather is always good and there's no such thing as hunger or pain. That was good, right? Because they give us an image of what heaven could be like. And here's the thing, right? Now we know, now we know why we want to go to heaven. We know why we think we should go to heaven. And we even have a sense of what heaven might look like. But the question is, does any of that matter? I mean, in the end, right, does it really matter what I think heaven looks like? Does it matter what, what, what reasons I think I should get to go to heaven or why I want to go to heaven? Because isn't what we're searching for is the truth, right? That, that's why we're here today. We want to know the truth. And what I want to take a moment to look at is, is what does Scripture actually say about these things? We know why we want to go. We know why we think we should. We know what we think it looks like. But what does Scripture say about the truth about heaven? What does, it, what does it teach us about what to expect and how to be able to experience this place for all eternity? And so what I want to show to you right now, I want to show you five truths about heaven, things that, that may you know, be very normal to you, things you've heard before, or things you might never have even imagined. And so let's look at these together, right? Here, here's five truths about heaven, and here's the first one. Truth number one is that we cannot imagine heaven. Right? I know we, we had the images from the kids. I know we all have images in our minds. But one of the things that Scripture teaches us is that we just can't imagine heaven. And let me show you where Scripture says this. In, in 1 Corinthians, it says, No eye has seen, 
No ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. In other words, what scripture is saying is that we just can't even imagine heaven. We can come up with some pretty good images. We can come up with things that we think are really amazing. But even those things don't come anywhere close. Right? Us trying to imagine heaven is like a sea monkey trying to understand democracy. Right? It's just too big. It's too broad of a concept. The sea monkey isn't anywhere close. Right? The sea monkey is, is like a thousand miles from the starting line of trying to understand democracy. And let's be honest, some of our politicians are probably still a thousand miles from the starting line of understanding democracy, but that's neither here nor there. Because the point is, it's just way too big for us to understand. It's just too big a concept. You may be able to imagine heaven, but the truth is, even your best thing that you can imagine, heaven is still a million times better. And so the first thing we need to know is that we cannot imagine heaven, but... What scripture does tell us is that we can catch glimpses, and that's number two. See, lesson number two, truth number two, is that creation is a glimpse of heaven. And let me show you where it says this. In the Psalms, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display their knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out to all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. See, what this passage is saying is that when we look at God's creation, we get this glimpse, right, this taste of what heaven could be like. When we go outside and we, we just look at the, the majesty of a mountain, right, or the beauty of the sky or the way the clouds just happen to come together in, in this beautiful picture that looks like, look, it's, like it's not even natural, like it has to be painted up there, it's so beautiful. But there's moments where you look into your child's eyes and you just realize this beautiful, simplistic, perfect beauty. What scripture is saying is that those are the moments that we get glimpses of heaven. Those are the moments where we get a taste. Those moments where we realize just how small we are, just how big God is, and just what beauty God can create. Those are the moments when we see heaven. And so this shows us, right, that we have to respect, we have to appreciate, we have to cherish this beautiful creation that God's put us in because this is a taste of what's to come. The next thing that we learn about heaven, the next truth about heaven that we find in scripture is that Jesus is the way to heaven. Jesus is the way to heaven. And look at where we see this. Jesus says, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I'd have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will surely come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. All right, so what Jesus is very clearly saying here is that, that he is coming to take us to heaven. He is the one who, who gives us access to heaven. He is the one through which we experience eternal life. If you look at scripture, Jesus says other things like, I am the way and the truth and the life. There is no way to the Father but through me. What Jesus is saying is that if we want to experience salvation, if we want to experience the kingdom of heaven, if we want to know eternal life, both in this life and in the life to come, then that comes through the one who died on the cross and rose from the dead and gives us the hope of eternal life. He is the one who prepares the way for us. He is the one who who takes us. It's not going to be by our own strength. It's not going to be by how good we are. It's not going to be by any of that other stuff. It is purely through the grace of God given to us through Jesus Christ. And then there's another lesson we learn in scripture about this same sort of thing, where Jesus tells us what does it take to enter heaven? And it's this. Truth number four is that we must enter heaven as children. Right, so Jesus tells us that, that he's the way to heaven, but then the other thing he says is that we have to enter heaven as children. And look at what he says. Jesus says, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will not ever enter it. See, this is just one of many passages where Jesus talks about the importance of children. 
Right? Scripture talks about this idea of having faith like a child, right? There's this other moment where Jesus says, if we can't accept children, then we can't accept him. Jesus is constantly, continuously pointing us to the faith of children, saying, look at these children, and you'll see what it takes to experience the kingdom of heaven. And the interesting thing about it is that Jesus doesn't necessarily point us to one particular thing. Right? Maybe Jesus is pointing us to the fact that children have such, such ready faith. Right? They're just ready to trust God. They have this very simple faith that's ready to just put their trust in God and not question too much. Or maybe he's, he's pointing out the fact that children have this innate goodness that is not corrupted until we get older, right? And that, that this is what it takes to enter the kingdom of God. See, the thing is, I don't know that Jesus is actually pointing us to one thing. What I think he's saying is, if you want to know what it takes to enter the kingdom of heaven, if you want to know what kind of faith you need to have, if you want to know what it looks like to love me, then watch the kids. Observe them, cherish them, love them. Pay attention to them, because in them, I have revealed this truth. I mean, the thing is, right, heaven is this, this beautiful place, and we want to be there. We want to know how to get there. We want to know what it takes. I think that's why we think so much about this. I think that's why years ago, right, 20, 25 years ago, there was a, a song that came out that just kind of captured the entire nation, Christians and non-Christians alike, called I Can Only Imagine. It was this person just singing about what it'll be like to be in heaven someday. And so I want you to hear this song right now, right, because this is, this is where we are, right? We're in this place that no matter whether we feel that life might end soon or life is going to end a long time from now, we want to experience this beauty of heaven. And so I want you to hear this song right now, sung by one of the members of our choir named Matt, where he's going to, he's going to share with you right, this, this beautiful words about what we'll feel and experience when we get to heaven. And so let's hear this together. It will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself standing in the sun I can only imagine when all I will do is forever forever worship you only imagine I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel Will I dance for you, Jesus Or in all of you be still Will I stand in your presence Or to my knees will I fall Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart be? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Lord, in all of you be Stand in your presence To my knees will I fall Will I sing hallelujah Will I be able to speak at all I can only imagine Yeah, yeah I can only imagine I can only imagine 
can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. That's beautiful, isn't it? That, that image of heaven, this idea of what we're going to experience. This is something we all want, right? We, we know what it is. We know what we want. We know why we want it. And this is what these truths in Scripture are telling us, right? They're telling us that we can't even imagine how good it's going to be. And they're telling us what it takes to be able to get to experience it. But there's one other truth in Scripture that I think we cannot miss. One that, that really might surprise you, and it's this. See, the fifth truth we need to realize about heaven is that constantly Scripture is telling us that heaven is coming here. Heaven is coming here. I want you to, I want you to hear this passage right now from a book in the Bible called Revelation, right? And everybody, when they hear that phrase, Revelation, they think that it's this book of the Bible talking about the end times and things like that, but... But one of the things that happens in this, in this book is that Jesus talks about this idea of a new heaven and a new earth. He gives us this, this beautiful picture that many people have always believed was a picture of what heaven's going to be like. And I want you to hear it. I want you to hear these words. In the scripture, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. See, what's so interesting is that often we hear those words and we think that this is a picture of what's going to happen when we get to heaven. If you look closely, what you realize is that these are words telling us that heaven is coming here, that God is planning to restore earth, right? Just look at those first two verses. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, right? It's not talking about some place we go. It's talking about something that's coming here. You see what scripture is saying, and we see just Jesus saying this constantly, is that, that heaven, that eternal life, it's not just some place that God is preparing for us to go after we die. It's something God wants us to experience right now. And that from the very beginning, when creation was ruined by fall and sin entering into the world, God has wanted to restore creation to what God intended it to be. What Jesus is constantly teaching us throughout his ministry is that the reason God has put us here, our purpose on this earth, is to not just wait for some day where we get to escape this world and go to heaven. It's to be God's people, bringing the kingdom of God down here to earth, showing people that they can have a taste of heaven now and they don't just have to suffer until they can escape. But that God wants this place to be restored and renewed to the beautiful creation God intended it to be. And God wants us to be a part of doing that. You know, it reminds me of something that happened to me in my very first year of ministry. Right after I got to this church, we learned about this mission called Branches down in Florida City, Florida. And it was supposed to be this incredible mission working with inner city kids down in Florida City, which is like just before you get to the Florida Keys, about as far down Florida as you can go before you hit water. And so before we decided to take our whole church or a bunch of people from our church on this mission trip, I went down for what's called an advanced trip, which is where you kind of go scope out the area, you get the lay of the land, you figure out what that mission trip's going to look like. 
and, and then you go back and you plan it. And so I went down to Florida City, and I have to tell you that it was one of the most powerful, life-changing experiences that I've ever had. Because when I got to Florida City, I realized that I was getting a taste of the kingdom of God. I mean, in this place in Florida, lives were being changed every day. The presence of God was palpable. And I realized that something was happening here that I had never before experienced. And this was the sort of thing God had put us here to do. But then something wild happened. When I got back on the plane to head back to Virginia, we got up in the air and we started to hit some, some turbulence. And I mean, it was, it was rough turbulence. I mean, it was the kind of turbulence that really begins to scare you. And when I looked out my window, I couldn't see anything. Right? I couldn't see sun shining through. I couldn't even see clouds. It was just blank. And I remember having this thought in my mind as I'm up there, you know, in the air, thinking, what if this was it? What, what if something happened and, and I'm dead and I don't even realize it, or if I died right now? You know the funny thing about it? I was, I was overwhelmed with grief in that moment. But it wasn't for the reasons you might think. It wasn't because I was going to miss Leanne or I was going to miss my parents or, or even that I was just afraid of, of death itself. It was because I realized that I had gotten a taste of what God has put us on this earth, a taste of what it means to bring heaven down here to earth. And when I looked at my life, I realized that I had never been a part of that, that I'd never done it, that God had put me here to do that kind of work. And I just hadn't done it yet. And what I feared more than anything else is that if I got to heaven, I didn't think that I'd earned those words from God, well done, good and faithful servant. You did what I put you there to do because I didn't think I'd done it. And that moment on that plane, I committed myself that for the rest of my life, I was going to make sure I could live without that regret that I'd gotten a taste of what it looks like to bring heaven to earth, and I was going to spend every day of my life making sure that happened. You see, here's the thing, friends. We all want to go to heaven. We all know why we think we should go. We've even heard what it takes to get there. But I think in the end, it's not just a question of whether or not we get to go or not. One of the questions that we have to wrestle with is, what is God going to say when we get there? Is God going to look at us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You did what I put you there to do. You brought heaven to earth. You brought my kingdom into this world. That's why I put you there. Or are we going to look back and say, we missed the chance? So I want to ask you, right? So what is it that God's speaking into your heart today? Right? You, might, you might know that you want to go to heaven. You know that, that you have reasons why you think you should go. And we've even talked about what it takes to be able to experience this eternal life. But what is God saying in your heart about, about what God's going to say when you get there? Right? When you get there, do you feel confident that you're going to hear God say those words, well done, good and faithful servant, you did what I wanted you to do? You're going to look back and realize that there was so much God was calling you to. You just never got to it. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks that we have this hope of a place we can go called heaven, a place where there is no pain, where we can reconnect with the people we love, where we can be with you for all eternity. And we give you thanks for your son, Jesus, who gives us this hope of eternal life. For God, as much as we want to go to heaven, Help us not to forget our task to bring heaven here, to be a blessing in the lives of others, to bring your kingdom and give people hope and the promise of salvation through Jesus. God, prepare us each day to say those, to, to hear those words, to live in a way that we will hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. You did exactly what I put you here to do. God, help us to be faithful to that command, to truly make disciples and bring your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's it for our service today. Thank you so much for being here. 
If you haven't done so already, take a moment and check out some of those links. Fill out your connection card, donate online, and join a small group. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We would love to personally invite you back next week as we continue our series, God on Film. We're gonna end with something special. The last few months, we have been praying what we call our 757 prayer. So please join as members of our church NLI team lead us in this prayer for our church and our city. Dear God, open our eyes each day to see the wonders you are performing in our lives and through, through our church. Inspire, Inspire us, us with, with your, your Holy Spirit, Spirit to be the church you, you desire us to be. And to be open to the work you are calling us to do. That in all things we may fulfill your command to make disciples. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.